Islamic audio bites. As it is the month of Muharram, we are taking a break from our featured read and have found some articles which we hope you will find of interest. Just to bear in mind, the next few episodes will not be of the usual length and will go on for a little bit longer because of the topics covered. So to crack on, I will be reading The Virtues of Allah's Sacred Month of Muharram and Fasting on Ashura, written by various authors and can be downloaded from islam.net. Let's read. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon our Prophet, peace be upon him, the seal of the prophets and chief of the messengers, and upon all his family and companions. Allah's sacred month of Muharram is a blessed and important month. It is the first month of the Hijri calendar and is one of the four sacred months concerning which Allah says, Verily, the number of months with Allah is twelve months in a year. So it was ordained by Allah on the day when he created the heavens and the earth. Of them, four are sacred. That is the right religion, so wrong not yourselves therein. Quran 9 verse 36 Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, The year is twelve months, of which four are sacred, the three consecutive months of Dhul Qadar, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab Mudar, which comes between Jamada and Shaban, reported by Al-Bukhari 2958. Muharram is so called because it is a sacred Muharram month and to confirm its sanctity. Allah's words, so wrong not yourselves therein, mean do not wrong yourselves in these sacred months because sin in these months is worse than in other months. It was reported that Ibn Abbas said that this phrase, so wrong not yourselves therein, referred to all the months. Then, these four were singled out and made sacred, so that sin in these months is more serious and good deeds bring a greater reward. Qutada said, concerning this phrase, so wrong not yourselves therein, that wrongdoing during the sacred months is more serious and more sinful than wrongdoing at any other time. Wrongdoing at any time is a serious matter, but Allah gives more weight to whichever of his commands he will. Allah has chosen certain ones of his creation. He has chosen from among the angels, messengers, and from among mankind, messengers. He chose from among speech, the remembrance of him, dhikr. He chose from among the earth, the mosques, from among the months, Ramadan, and the sacred months. From among the days, Friday, and from among the nights, Laylat al Qadr. So, venerate that which Allah has told us to venerate. People of understanding and wisdom venerate the things that Allah has told us to venerate. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, The best of fasting after Ramadan is fasting Allah's month of Muharram, reported by Muslim 1982. The phrase Allah's month, connecting the name of the month to the name of Allah in a genitive grammatical structure, signifies the importance of the month. Al-Qari said, the apparent meaning is all of the month of Muharram, but it was proven that the Prophet, peace be upon him, never fasted any whole month apart from Ramadan. So this hadith is probably meant to encourage increasing one's fasting during Muharram, without meaning that one should fast for the entire month. It was reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to fast more in Shaban. It is likely that the virtue of Muharram 
was not revealed to him until the end of his life, before he was able to fast during this month. Allah chooses whatever times and places he wills. Al-Iz ibn Abd al-Salam said, Times and places may be given preferred status in two ways, either temporal or religious, spiritual. With regard to the latter, this is because Allah bestows his generosity on his slaves at those times or in those places by giving a greater reward for deeds done, such as giving a greater reward for fasting in Ramadan than for fasting at all other times, and also on the day of Ashura, the virtue of which is due to Allah's generosity and kindness towards his slaves on that day. Ashura in History Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Prophet, peace be upon him, came to Medina and saw the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura. He said, What is this? They said, This is a righteous day. It is the day when Allah saved the children of Israel from their enemies. So Musa fasted on this day. He said, We have more right to Musa than you. So he fasted on that day and commanded the Muslims to fast on that day. This is a righteous day in a report narrated by Muslim. The Jews said, This is a great day on which Allah saved Musa and his people and drowned Pharaoh and his people. Musa fasted on this day, a report narrated by Muslim adds, in thanksgiving to Allah, so we fast on this day. According to a report narrated by Al-Bukhari, so we fast on this day to venerate it. A version narrated by Imam Ahmad adds, This is the day on which the ark settled on Mount Judi. So Nur fasted this day in thanksgiving and commanded the Muslims to fast on that day. According to another report also narrated by Al-Bukhari, he, the Prophet peace be upon him, said to his companions, You have more right to Musa than they do, so fast on that day. The practice of fasting on Ashura was known even in the days of Jahiliya before the Prophet peace be upon his mission. It was reported that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, The people of Jahiliya used to fast on that day. Al Qurtubi said, Perhaps Quraysh used to fast on that day on the basis of some past law, such as that of Ibrahim, upon whom be peace. It was also reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to fast on Ashura in Mecca before he migrated to Medina. When he migrated to Medina, he found the Jews celebrating this day, so he asked them why, and they replied, as described in the Hadith quoted above. He commanded the Muslims to be different from the Jews, who took it as a festival, as was reported in the Hadith of Abu Musa, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, The Jews used to take the day of Ashura as a festival, according to a report narrated by Muslim, the day of Ashura was venerated by the Jews, who took it as a festival. According to another report, also narrated by Muslim, the people of Haybar, the Jews, used to take it as a festival, and their women would wear their jewellery and symbols on that day. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, So you, Muslims, should fast on that day. Apparently, the motive for commanding the Muslims to fast on this day was the desire to be different from the Jews. So the Muslims would fast when the Jews did not, because people do not fast on a day of celebration. Fasting on Ashura was a gradual step in the process of introducing fasting as a prescribed obligation in Islam. Fasting appeared in three forms. When the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, came to Medina, he told the Muslims to fast on three days of every month and on the day of Ashura. Then Allah made fasting obligatory when he said, Observing the fasting is prescribed for you. Quran 2 verse 183. The obligation was transferred from the fast of Ashura to the fast of Ramadan, and this one of the proofs in the field of Usul al-Fiqh that it is possible to abrogate 
a lighter duty in favour of a heavier duty. Before the obligation of fasting, Ashura was abrogated. Fasting on this day was obligatory, as can be seen from the clear command to observe this fast. Then it was further confirmed later on, then reaffirmed by making it a general command addressed to everybody and once again by instructing mothers not to breastfeed their infants during this fast. It was reported from Ibn Masud that when fasting Ramadan was made obligatory, the obligation to fast Ashura was lifted, i.e. it was no longer obligatory to fast on this day, but it is still desirable, mustahab. Ibn Abbas said, I never saw the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, so keen to fast any day and give it priority over any other than this day, the day of Ashura, and this month, meaning Ramadan. Al-Bukhari 1867 The meaning of his being keen was that he intended to fast on that day in the hope of earning the reward for doing so. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, For fasting the day of Ashura, I hope that Allah will accept it as expiation for the year that went before. Muslim 1976 This is from the bounty of Allah towards us. For fasting one day, he gives us expiation for the sins of a whole year. And Allah is the owner of great bounty. Al-Nawawi said, Ashura and Tasua are two elongated names. The vowels are elongated, as is stated in books on the Arabic language. Our companion said, Ashura is the tenth day of Muharram, and Tasua is the ninth day. This is our opinion and that of the majority of scholars. This is the apparent meaning of the Ahadith, and this is what we understand from the general wording. It is also what is usually understood by scholars of the language. Ashura is an Islamic name that was not known at the time of Jahiliya. Ibn Qudama, may Allah have mercy on him, said, Ashura is the tenth day of Muharram. This is the opinion of Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib and al-Hasan. This is what was reported by Ibn Abbas, who said, The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, commanded us to fast Ashura, the tenth day of Muharram. It was reported that Ibn Abbas said the ninth and reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to fast the ninth. Atta reported that he said, Fast the ninth and the tenth and do not be like the Jews. If this is understood, we can say on this basis that it is mustahab, encouraged, to fast on the ninth and the tenth for that reason. This is what Ahmad said, and it is the opinion of Ishaq. It is Musahab encouraged to fast Taswa with Ashura. Abd Allah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them both, said, When the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, fasted on Ashura and commanded the Muslims to fast as well, they said, O Messenger of Allah, it is a day that is venerated by the Jews and the Christians. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, If I live to see the next year, inshallah, we will fast on the ninth day too. But it so happened that the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, passed away before the next year came. Muslim 1916 al Shafai and his companions, Ahmad, Ishaq and others said, It is mustahab to fast on both the ninth and ten days, because the Prophet, peace be upon him, fasted on the tenth, and intended to fast on the ninth. On this basis, it may be said that there are varying degrees of fasting, Ashura, the least of which is to fast only on the tenth, and the best of which is to fast the ninth as well. The more one fasts in Muharram, the better it is. The reason why it is mustahab to fast on Taswa. Al Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, said, The scholars, our companions, 
and others mention several reasons why it is mustahab to fast on Zasua. 1. The intention behind it is to be different from the Jews, who only venerate the tenth day. This opinion was reported from Ibn Abbas. 2. The intention is to add another day's fast to Ashura. This is akin to the prohibition on fasting a Friday by itself, as was mentioned by Al-Khatabi and others. 3. To be on the safe side and make sure that one fasts on the 10th, in case there is some error in sighting the crescent moon at the beginning of Muharram, and the 9th is in fact the 10th. The strongest of these reasons is being different from people of the book. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, The Prophet, peace be upon him, forbade imitating the people of the book in many a hadith. For example, his words concerning Ashura. If I live until the next year, I will certainly fast on the ninth day. Ibn Hajar, may Allah be pleased with him, said in his commentary on the hadith, If I live until the next year, I will certainly fast on the ninth day. What he meant by fasting on the ninth day was probably not that he would limit himself to that day, but would add it to the tenth, either to be on the safe side or to be different from the Jews and Christians, which is more likely. This is also what we can understand from some of the reports narrated by Muslim. Sheikh al-Islam said, Fasting on the day of Ashura is an expiation for a year and it is not makruh to fast early that day. In Tuhfat al-Muhtaj by Ibn Hajar al hatami it says, There is nothing wrong with fasting only on Ashura. Fasting on Ashura, even if it is a Saturday or a Friday. Al-Takhawi, may Allah have mercy on him, said, The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, allowed us to fast on Ashura and urged us to do so. He did not say that if it falls on a Saturday, we should not fast. This is evidence that all days of the week are included in this. In our view, and Allah knows best, it could be the case that even if this is true, that it is not allowed to fast on Saturdays, it is so that we do not venerate this day and refrain from food, drink and intercourse as the Jews do. As for the one who fasts on a Saturday without intending to venerate it, and does not do so because the Jews regard it as blessed, then it is not makru. The author of Al-Minhaj said, It is disliked, makru, to fast on a Friday alone, but it is no longer makru if you add another day to it, as mentioned in the Sahih report to that effect. A person may fast on a Friday if it coincides with his habitual fast, or if he's fasting in fulfilment of a vow, or he's making up an obligatory fast that he has missed, as was stated in a Sahih report. Al Shari said in Tufat al Muhtaj, if it coincides with his habitual fast, i.e., such as if he fasts alternate days and a day that he fasts happens to be a Friday, if he is fasting in fulfilment of a vow, etc., this also applies to fasting on days prescribed in Sharia, such as Ashura or Arafah. Al Bukhuti, may Allah have mercy on him, said, It is makru to deliberately single out a Saturday for fasting because of the hadith of Abd Allah ibn Bishr, who reported from his sister, Do not fast on Saturdays except in the case of obligatory fasts. And because it is a day that is venerated by the Jews, so singling it out for fasting means being like them, except when a Friday or Saturday coincides with a day when Muslims habitually fast, such as when it coincides with the day of Arafah or the day of Ashura, and a person has the habit of fasting on these days, in which case it is not magru because a person's habit carries some weight. Ahmed said, If there is confusion about the beginning of the month, 
one should fast for three days to be sure of fasting on the ninth and ten days. If a person does not know when Muharram began and he wants to be sure of fasting on the tenth, he should assume that Dhul Hijjah was thirty days as is the usual rule and should fast on the ninth and tenth. Whoever wants to be sure of fasting the ninth as well should fast the eighth, ninth, and tenth. And then, if Dhul Hijjah was 29 days, he can be sure of having fasted Zasua and Ashura. But given that fasting on Ashura is Mustahab rather than Wajib, people are not commanded to look for the crescent of the new moon of Muharram, as they are to do in the case of Ramadan and Shawal. Fasting Ashura, for what does it offer expiation? Al Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him, said, It expiates for all minor sins, i.e., it brings forgiveness of all sins except major sins. Then he said, Fasting the day of Arafah expiates for two years, and the day of Ashura expiates for one year. If, when a person says Amin, it coincides with the Amin of the angels, he will be forgiven all his previous sins. Each one of the things that we have mentioned will bring expiation. If there are minor sins for which expiation is needed, expiation for them will be accepted. If there are no minor sins or major sins, good deeds will be added to his account and he will be raised in status. If he had committed major sins but no minor sins, we hope that his major sins will be reduced. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, said, Tahara, Salah and fasting in Ramadan on the day of Arafah and on Ashura expiate for minor sins only. Not relying too much on the reward for fasting. Some people who are deceived rely too much on things like fasting on Ashura or the day of Arafah to the extent that some of them say fasting on Ashura will expiate for the sins of the whole year and the fasting on the day of Arafah will bring extra rewards. Ibn al Qayyim said, This misguided person does not know that fasting in Ramadan and praying five times a day are much more important than fasting on the day of Arafah and Ashura and that they expiate for the sins between one Ramadan and the next or between one Friday and the next so long as one avoids major sins. But they cannot expiate for minor sins unless one also avoids major sins. When the two things are put together, they have the strength to expiate for minor sins. Among those deceived people may be one who thinks that his good deeds are more than his sins because he does not pay attention to his bad deeds or check on his sins. But if he does a good deed, he remembers it and relies on it. This is like the one who seeks Allah's forgiveness with his tongue, i.e. by words alone and glorifies Allah by saying Subhan Allah 100 times a day. Then he backbites about the Muslims and slanders their honour and speaks all day long about things that are not pleasing to Allah. This person is always thinking about the virtues of his tasbihat, saying Subhanallah, and takhliyat, saying La ilaha illallah. But he pays no attention to what has been reported concerning those who backbite, tell lies and slander others or commit other sins of the tongue. They are completely deceived. The fuqaha differed concerning the rule on observing voluntary fasts before a person has made up days that he or she did not fast in Ramadan. The Hanafis said it is permissible to observe voluntary fasts before making up days from Ramadan, and it is not makru to do so because the missed days do not have to be made up straight away. The Malikis and the Shafais said it is permissible, but it is makru because it means that one is delaying something obligatory. Al-Jasuki said, It is makru 
to observe a voluntary fast when one still has to make up an obligatory fast, such as a fast in fulfilment of a vow or missed obligatory fast or a fast done as an act of expiation, kafara. Whether the voluntary fast, which is being given priority over an obligatory fast, is something confirmed in Sharia or not, such as Ashura and the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, according to the most correct opinion. The Hanbalis said it is haram to observe a voluntary fast before making up any fasts missed in Ramadan, and that a voluntary fast in such cases does not count, even if there is plenty of time to make up the obligatory fast. So a person must give priority to the obligatory fasts until he has made them up. Muslims must hasten to make up any missed fasts after Ramadan so that they will be able to fast Arafah and Ashura without any problem. If a person fasts Arafah and Ashura with the intention from the night before of making up for a missed fast, this will be good enough to make up what he has missed, for the bounty of Allah is great. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was asked about things that people do on Ashura, such as wearing kohl, taking a bath, ghusl, wearing henna, shaking hands with one another, cooking grains, habab, showing happiness, and so on. Was any of this reported from the Prophet, peace be upon him, in a sahih hadith or not? If nothing to that effect was reported in a sahih hadith, is doing these things bidda or not? Is there any basis for what the other group do, such as grieving and mourning, going without anything to drink, eulogizing and wailing, reciting in a crazy manner and rending their garments? His reply was, Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Nothing to that effect has been reported in any sahih hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him, or from his companions. None of the imams of the Muslims encouraged or recommended such things, neither the four imams nor any others. No reliable scholars have narrated anything like this, neither from the Prophet, peace be upon him, nor from the Sahaba, nor from the Tabayeen, neither in any Sahih report or in any Zayf, weak report, neither in the books of Sahih, nor in Al-Sunnah, nor in the Musnads, no hadith of this nature was known during the best centuries. But some of the later narrators reported a hadith like the one which says, whoever puts call in his eyes on the days of Ashura will not suffer from eye disease in that year. And whoever takes a bath does ghusl on that day of Ashura will not get sick in that year, and so on. They also reported a fabricated hadith that is falsely attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, which says, whoever is generous to his family on that day of Ashura, Allah will be generous to him for the rest of the year. Reporting all of this from the Prophet, peace be upon him, is tantamount to lying. Then he, Ibn Taymiyyah, discussed in brief the tribulations that had occurred in the early days of this Ummah and the killing of al Hussein and what the various sects had done because of this. Then he said, An ignorant wrongful group who were either heretics and hypocrites or misguided and misled made a show of allegiance to him and the members of his household. So they took the day of Ashura as a day of mourning and wailing in which they openly displayed the rituals of jahiliya, such as slapping their cheeks and rending their garments, grieving in the manner of the jahiliya. The shaitan made this attractive to those who are misled, so they took the day of Ashura as an occasion of mourning, when they grieve and wail, recite poems of grief, and tell stories filled with lies. Whatever truth there may be in these stories serves no purpose other than the renewal of their grief and sectarian feeling and the stirring up of hatred and hostility among the Muslims, which they do by cursing those who came before them. The evil and harm that they do to the Muslims 
cannot be enumerated by any man, no matter how eloquent he is. Some others, either Nesibis who oppose and have enmity towards al Hussein and his family, or ignorant people who try to fight evil with evil, corruption with corruption, lies with lies, and bidda with bidda, opposed them by fabricating reports in favour of making the day of Ashura a day of celebration by wearing kol and henna, spending money on one's children, cooking special dishes and other things that are done on Eids and special occasions. These people took the day of Ashura as a festival like Eid, whereas the others took it as a day of mourning. Both are wrong and go against the Sunnah. Even though the other group, those who take it as a day of mourning, are worse in intention and more ignorant and more plainly wrong. Neither the Prophet, peace be upon him, nor his successors, the Khulafa al Rashidun, did any of these things on the day of Ashura. They neither made it a day of mourning nor a day of celebration. As for the other things, such as cooking special dishes with or without grains, or wearing new clothes, or spending money on one's family, or buying the year's supplies on that day, or doing special acts of worship, such as special prayers, slaughtering an animal on that day, or saving some of the meat of the sacrifice to cook with grains, or wearing coal and henna, or taking a bath, or shaking hands with one another, or visiting one another, or visiting the mosques and mashads, shrines, and so on, all of this is reprehensible bidda and is wrong. None of it has anything to do with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, or the way of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. It was not approved by any of the imams of the Muslim, not Malik, not Al-Thari, not Al-Layth ibn Sa'd, not Abu Hanifa, not al Uzai, not al Shafai, not Ahmad ibn Hanbal, not Ishaq ibn Rahwe, not any of the imams and scholars of the Muslims. Ibn al Hajj, may Allah have mercy on him, mentioned one of the bidas on Ashura was deliberately paying zakah on this day, late or early, or slaughtering a chicken just for this occasion, or, in the case of women, using henna. We ask Allah to make us followers, the sunnah of his noble prophet, peace be upon him, to make us live in Islam and die in a state of faith. May he help us do that which he loves and which pleases him. We ask him to help us remember him and be thankful to him, to worship him properly and to accept our good deeds. May he make us of those who are pious and fear him. May Allah bless our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all his family and companions. That is it for today. It was a bit of a long episode this time round, but we felt it was important to get into the detail of Ashura. We hope you are finding our podcast useful. Can I please ask you that you go on Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating? It would be truly appreciated. And also remember to share our podcast with family and friends. We are on all the usual channels, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or any other podcast platform. We are also on YouTube as a voice-only channel. Do check out our website at islamicaudiobytes.com. Please do join our Islamic Audio Bytes community on Facebook. We are also on Reddit, Twitter and Instagram. Do check them out. Otherwise, I hope you are staying safe. Hope your day is full of goodness. Assalamu alaikum.